Hello to Euro PCR 2019. I am joined today by Atul Patek, who is a cardiologist and a pharmacologist working at the Clinique Pasteur in Toulouse. Thank Hi. you, welcome. Thank you. Um, so we're going today to talk about cardiovascular drugs and what every interventional cardiologist needs to know about. Um, could you tell me, what are the, what are the most important um, changes in the most recent uh, drug therapy? I think there are three major changes. Uh, the first one being with uh, new lipid lowering drugs, the PCSK9 inhibitors. The second major changes are um, uh, the new anti diabetic drug with GLP 1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. And finally, new settings in the, in the way you would manage anti thrombotic drugs with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, but also the interaction with. Uh, uh, these new oral anticoagulants. Wow, so we've got a lot to get through. So let's start from the beginning then for the PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, are they safe? Are they well tolerated? Yeah, I think uh, you have to put the, the benefit risk ratio uh, and, and to really assess the first effect that uh, these drugs are reducing the rate of events and uh, two drugs have been tested in very large uh, uh, cardiovascular outcome trial and both trials were able to show that in high-risk patients on the top of standard of care both PCSK9 inhibitors were able to reduce what we call MACE uh, major adverse cardiovascular event and uh, referring to your question about safety there were some issues uh, because we learned from statin trial that when you reduce LDL cholesterol in a very aggressive way, you might increase the rate of stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, but also the incidence of diabetes. And in this uh, situation with PCSK9 inhibitors, we can really say that they are safe. No increased risk of diabetes and no increased risk of stroke. Fantastic. And they're, they come in as a, a nice compact pen, which is easily uh, injectable. I'm told, and they are pretty well tolerated by patients. Uh, absolutely. I mean, they are very easy to use drugs. I mean, uh, they look like pens we are using in the field of diabetes. So according to the drug, one injection per month or one injection every two weeks, it's easy to do. It's not painful at all. And yeah. you see a dramatic decrease in LDL cholesterol within eight to 10 weeks. So easy to use, practical drugs, which are effective in, in lowering lipid level. Fantastic. And we've just got to hope that patients don't stop their statins in addition to that. Absolutely. Um, OK, let's move on then to the, um, the glucose lowering medication or the diabetic medication. What's, what's really changed in the market there? Yeah, I think that the, the, the very important information is that there are now classes of drugs we use in the field of diabetes who have changed the outcome of our diabetic patient by reducing morbidity and mortality. There was a wrong belief that if you are able to reduce the level of sugar or glycated hemoglobinemia, you will be able to reduce both the outcome in terms of microvascular and macrovascular event. But this belief was wrong. And what we have learned in the past years is that we finally have these drugs which are indeed reducing uh, the, the occurrence of heart outcomes in these diabetic patients. Some of them belong to the class we call GLP-1 uh, agonists uh, and the other class uh, are the, the, the so-called SGLT2 inhibitors. So two drug of choices who are really changing the way we need to treat our diabetic patient. Wow, and do you think there's going to be an uptake with cardiologists taking over this control and, and feeling sort of liberated to treat with these drugs? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important practical question. What we have learned is that probably in those of our diabetic patients who are having heart failure or sometimes cardiorenal syndrome, we'll try to go for SGLT2 inhibitors on the top of standard of care. For those of our patients who are having an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, post-ACS or post-stroke, probably GLP-1 uh, agonists are, are doing a, a better job. Uh, and um, the question is now there, uh, are cardiologists going to prescribe these anti-diabetic drugs as they are already doing with statin or ACE inhibitors, or do we still need the support of diabetologists? I think it's a little bit early. We still need diabetologists in order to tailor and optimize the way you want to manage these diabetic patients. But tomorrow, because some trials are going on showing that these drugs could be used, for example, in heart failure patients for SGLT2 inhibitors, but heart failure patients without diabetes. So the future mm -hmm. uh, is probably that we might uh, be starting to prescribe these drugs, especially SGLT2 inhibitors, mm -hmm. in heart failure patients without diabetes. So mm -hmm. it's a story we need to follow. Yeah, and with both of these two um, classes of drugs and the PCP, CSK9 inhibitors, there's a, a real move to, 
to treating our patients with hard clinical endpoints as well. So we're seeing, um, uh, you know, really good uh, changes in, in clinical care. Um, so let's just move on then to the um, antithrombotic therapy. So what's changed in that? Yeah, I think there are some important key messages. I think the first one being that uh, no need for aspirin in primary prevention. I think this is a really a, a big change in the way we are managing the risk of our patients. So really the evidence are now there. Uh, aspirin has a kind of slight positive effect but the benefit with ratio is not in favor of aspirin in primary prevention because the risk of bleeding is higher than the benefits of mm. reducing the risk of, of vascular event. Okay. Um, maybe the other information would be regarding dual antiplatelet therapy, mm. which needs to be tailored in our high-risk patient. Uh, again, this benefit with ratio, bleeding versus ischemic event, and probably that we are at a situation where you still need six months of dual antiplatelet therapy in these patients who are uh, going to uh, be offered a stand mm. and finally the, the last uh, important information is how to manage the combination of uh, oral anticoagulants and, and dual antiplatelet therapy and the general message would be try to reduce the doses of oral anticoagulant therapy try to stick to a single antiplatelet agent and then reassess again the benefit with ratio uh, of this combination therapy in our high-risk patient. Perfect. And what are your thoughts about enteric coated aspirin? Because we see a lot of patients treated with that. Yeah, I think this is an important information. I think we know that this type of aspirin has a better pharmacokinetic profile. Uh, the also very important message is that we might not need to go for very high dosage of aspirin. I mean, low dosage of aspirin are enough to protect our patient. And finally, sometimes uh, you need to uh, combine these drugs with uh, proton pump inhibitor. I mm. think uh, Philippe Gabriel Stag really shared this information with us that the breathing risk is there. So sometimes you need to get the help of these uh, drugs, uh, PPI, in these patients. Perfect. And just going on to our patients with poor renal function, have you got any tips and tricks as to how to manage them? So I think a patient with uh, decreased EGFR are also known as patient at risk for both ischemic event but also for bleeding so uh, th there is really now a, a very important information about reducing the doses of these oral anticoagulant uh, therapy when EGFR is reduced usually a threshold according to the drugs which might be slightly different but really we need to be very cautious uh, by when we use these type of drugs in patients with uh, low EGFR. Okay. Well thank you very much for joining me and thank you for joining us at Euro PCR in 2019.